everyone. Welcome to today's episode of The Dough Doctor. I'm your host and baking expert, Chef Colette, and I have a great show planned for you today. Thank you so much for joining me in the kitchen, and if you're watching on the replay later on, thank you so much for tuning in. All right, let's get started. So today, you know, I was surprised, everybody. I did not get a ton of questions. I, you guys, it must have been smooth sailing for you for your Thanksgiving baking. So let us know, pop it in the comments below. What did you bake for Thanksgiving? And how was the experience? Did everything go well or were there some hiccups? Uh, I know that usually for the holiday, we're fighting for oven space, but um, hopefully you had that all figured out and you didn't have to uh, wait or worry about the turkey. So let us know. And also let us know where you're logging on from. It's always fun to see um, where people are watching the show from. So again, thank you so much for joining me. We had one question, which was a fabulous question. So um, I'm gonna take that question right away. And if you guys have questions, as I always say, drop them in the comments below. Oh, pistol packing mama, before I get into the question. Um, pistol packing mama says her dinner rolls were delicious. Of course they were. I have absolutely no doubt at all. All right, everybody. So SD Traveling Kitchen wrote in and asked about potatoes in bread doughs. Why would a baker or why would a recipe have either leftover mashed potato? Why would they have, why would there be mashed potato in a bread dough? And SD also let me know that she had seen this technique in a Craftsy bread class. So shout out to Craftsy and that's a perfect segue to let you guys know that at mon on Monday at two o'clock central time, I'll be going live on Craftsy doing a demo, making um, alfajores, uh, a holiday themed alfajores filled with delicious dulce de leche. And if you want to grab that link so you can join on Monday, it's in my link tree right by my little face on my Instagram profile, so you can't miss it. Um, yes, this I'm actually organized today. Amazing! All right, so potatoes in bread dough. Well, you won't believe it, but back in the day, before commercial yeast was readily available, bakers used, you know, sourdough starters and, and try to grab as much wild yeast as possible. And remember bakers, wild natural yeasts are everywhere. They're in the air, they're on us, they're on our stuff, they're just everywhere. So we've talked about sourdough starters before, but think about it, when we make a matrix of flour and water and we let it sit, we're attracting wild natural yeast microorganisms. Well, if you put potatoes in the mix with that lovely, lovely starch, they're even more attracted. They're like, yeah, baby, I'm in. So back in the day, and we're talking, mm, you know, like 19th century, if you really wanted to ensure that your bread would really work out well, you threw in a little leftover potato or saved your potato water from cooking your potatoes. And remember, we made a shoe starch in these modern times, but back then calories counted to get you around, so potatoes were a staple. So anyway, back in the day, potatoes activated natural yeasts and got them going and made better, more voluminous bread. But now when paired with paired with yeast and mixed into a dough, what they provide is a beautiful, golden, crisp crust, not a flaky crust like a baguette, but imagine a perfect cinnamon roll with that beautiful light golden brown crust 
that you just bite into and it's a little, no pun intended, slice of heaven. So the potato affects the crust and it also affects the crumb structure. The inside is light, it's tender, it's velvety, amazing. So if you have any leftover potatoes and you're making a batch of bread, don't be afraid to add a little to the dough. And I know I hear you, how much chef? Well, you're always looking at the flour percentage. So maybe about 15 to 20% of that overall percentage of flour. So crust color, crumb, and also an excellent food source for today's commercial yeast. When you make a potato bread or a batch of potato cinnamon rolls, you'll notice that the dough bulk ferments and proofs just a little faster because your yeast is getting an excellent lunch and it's producing the carbon dioxide even more quickly. So that's it. Esty, that was a fabulous question. So I'm just gonna take a look and see, I don't see any new questions. So I think I'm gonna sail into demo, but go ahead, of course, please drop your questions and comments um, below and I will, I'll get them, I'll, I'll get them on a break from demoing rugula. And I know a few of you noticed, but in yesterday's post, the um, Instagram powers that be auto-corrected rugula to arugula. And I left it. I just thought it was hilarious. So um, yeah, we could make a savory arugula rugula. We're not gonna do that today, but we absolutely could do it. We'll put a pin in that for another time. All right, so rugula is a traditional holiday cookie, usually made around December, around Hanukkah, and it is incredibly versatile. Now I've added a spin on it. Well, first of all, I gotta tell you guys, I would be remiss. There are two types of rugula. Rugula started out as a laminated dough with yeast, very similar to croissant. And then in the 1950s, think Mrs. Maisel, right? In the 1950s, it kind of morphed into a cream cheese dough. And in the 1950s, uh, that's where cream cheese dough was born because here was this amazing product on the market that as far as bakers, pastry chefs, and home bakers were, were um, concerned, this was fab. So that's where rugula changed. Now, you can find recipes for both. We're going to do a traditional holiday uh, rugula today with cream cheese and butter, but we're going to add the spin of laminating it. And you know, bakers, I will laminate anything. And full disclosure, when I did my CMB, my Certified Master Baker certification, rugula was one of our wild cards. Not only is that exam 16 hours long, but there are undisclosed recipes that are um, disclosed at the exam time to the, um, just before the exam time, to the, uh, oh God, I forgot what you call people, the um, chefs who wanna get certified. That's who they are. Um, anyhow, so uh, in that moment, I had an amazing tutorial by one of our judges, Chef Leanne, and I'm gonna pass that on to you. And you will see, here's a little Finnish cute, so cute baked rugula. And you're gonna see how to build glorious layers into this cookie. Now, typically, there's no sugar in the dough, and there doesn't need to be, because we're gonna add sugar on top and in our filling. So that's, they're naturally set up to be a savory dough. And there's no reason why you couldn't use rugula for other things like um, the same dough 
for like tartlet shells. I'd keep it small, um, not like a big, there are some really credible cream cheese pie crusts out there. Not for something too big, but you know, this could be a good back pocket recipe, especially if you're looking for a small hors d'oeuvre, some arugula pesto, uh, arugula pesto arugula, sure, why not? All right, so let's get started, everybody. I have Magic of TV, I have dough made, I have baked arugula, and the first thing I'm gonna do is show you how to make the dough, all right? So this is a small batch. This recipe, <laughs> I will learn to talk. This recipe will be live on the website, bakingwithcolette.com. The link to the website is in my link tree. It will be live early Monday morning with some extra photos, extra tutorial, so that um, you can ha you'll have all the information to make these delicious rugula. Plus, I'll have a reminder on Monday's post that the rugula is actually the rugula recipe is actually live. All right. So again, it's a small batch. This will make about 20 rugula, the size that I just showed you. You can always scale it up or down. One of the reasons, and I don't know about you guys, I know you like small batch recipes. What I'm falling like in love with them is because they give us practice. And that's what makes us better bakers, that repetition. That's what really does it. I've found that by the time we're on our third or fourth time of, of producing a recipe, we've really got a head of steam and you can see the improvement. Anyway, so I could go on about that for a while. I won't. Let's get to our rugula. So I have, this recipe is really simple. It's equal parts butter, unsalted butter, cream cheese and flour, and a little bit of salt. Remember, in a recipe like this, a cookie recipe, a muffin recipe, a cake recipe, the salt helps sweet things taste less sweet. It also affects the crumb a little bit, which is a good thing in this, in this particular dough. All right, so look, bakers, look at this butter. One thing that is, and I see this all the time when, I, when I'm, I'm grading my culinary students, one thing that we sometimes do not do is cut our butter up into small pieces. It really equalizes the temperature of the butter and that's so important whether we're softening it or in this case, we're just letting it kind of, we're letting it acclimate to the kitchen. I literally pulled this out of the refrigerator about five minutes before I hit the live button. So this is gonna be sitting out, what is it, 12, 12 my time. This will have been sitting out about 10, 15 minutes. I don't want to soften it, okay? So what we're gonna do, again, it's just kind of acclimated, acclimatized, anyway. We could think of a lot of words. So, this can also be made in the food processor, but I'm gonna use the mixer because I think most of you have a mixer. It can also be made by hand. All right, let me get this out of the way. Okay, so now we're gonna start on low speed and the reason for this is because I really don't want any butter or cream cheese to fly up in my face. But as soon as I know that's not going to happen and it's just beginning to mix, then I'm going to go to medium speed just for about a minute, minute and a half. All we want to do is bring these two together. It's like a first date. Oh, you know, I cannot operate the mixer with my mind. I have to plug it in. One day, like telepathic baking. Again, not softening, just kind of let it get used to room temperature, but we're not softening. And even if it doesn't mix all the way, doesn't matter because I'm adding that extra step of laminating this dough. 
Do you have to laminate? No, but, oh, come on, it's like so much fun. Now I'm on medium. And it's about, it's not long, it, it, it's not long. All right, let me grab a spatula and I want to show you because that's what really helps. See that? See, that's it. Pretty much they're mixed together. The whole mixture is kind of taken on. It's very pale yellow. I don't want to whip any air into this. I'm just bringing these together. That's it. Now, but it's, it's kind of a mess in that look at my paddle. So you gotta get in here and you have to clean the paddle. That's important. We don't want any rogue undermixed butter and cream cheese. And then we're gonna scrape down and get the bottom as well. And then, okay, we're good. We're gonna attach the paddle and we're using unbleached all-purpose flour. And I know that I talked about unbleached all-purpose flour when we were doing our pie dough two weeks ago. And I hope that worked out for you guys. Let me know in the comments below if, if, if it did. Um, fingers crossed that it did. Um, because when, we, when we're rolling out this dough, the, we, we want the flour to be unbleached so that we don't get springiness. That's what happens with um, bleached flour when we're trying to do, again, bleached flour is fine for most things, but not when we're rolling, not when we're folding, not when we're really asking a lot of, of the gluten. Like, hey, you're gonna line this pie pan. Hey, you're gonna make really beautiful triangles and gorgeous pastry. We really need it to be unbleached. All right, now I wanna show you something that sometimes I think about you when you're in your kitchens and I think to myself, what are their questions? You know, what stops them? And this is super simple. It's like nothing, like really chef? I know, I hear you. But I just wanna talk about a fix. When you're sifting, and you may be using different kinds of salt, or you may be sifting almond flour for macarons, and you end up, see, I've got, it's, there's stuff left, there's salt left in the sifter. So what do we do? I mean, what do we really do in order to do this properly? Well, I'm gonna dump it into the flour, and then I'm gonna take a whisk, and I'm gonna whisk. Now that might seem like very simplistic, but that's what you're gonna do. We're not gonna skip the whisk, but anything that's still, anything that's left in the sifter, we need it. And so we're just gonna add it and then we're gonna combine. I'm not a big fan of, of whisking dry ingredients, uh, we've been over this a bunch of times. I'm not a big fan of whisking dry ingredients when we really actually should be sifting. All right, there, I'm off my soapbox. So now I'm gonna add my flour and remember we're all equal parts. All right, okay. And low speed, so no flour showers just until this comes together. Have your spatula on deck. And as it, as it becomes a cohesive mass, stop, and we're gonna scrape down. Okay? All right. Almost there. So this is how it looks. Needs a little bit more. Whoops. And I've got to make sure, you know how the mixer is designed. There's a little, uh, 
ingredients can get stuck at the bottom. So we have to scrape down. That's it. Now it still kind of looks a little bit, it's messy. It's messy in the bowl, but that's okay. So what I'm gonna do so you guys can really see, I'm gonna move the mixer. All right, and we're gonna get the dough off the paddle. And that's the texture right now. This is the texture right now. It smells great. And you can fill them. There's so many, jam uh, well, we'll talk about that in a second. I won't, I would, don't wanna get ahead of myself, but. Whoops, just drop that on the floor. That's okay, I have another one right here. I imagine that happens at the Food Network all the time. Okay, so here's our dough. And then I have my bench flour, my bench flour right here. This is just unbleached all-purpose flour. So you could just wrap this dough, form it into a neat, tidy little disc, or actually divide it in half form it into neat, tidy little disc and put it in the refrigerator. But we're gonna laminate. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw down some flour. And remember, we work with the flour and not in the flour. And I'm gonna plop my dough down on, my, on, the, on the work surface here. And the thing is, I just don't want it to stick. Now the first, the first roll is rough, and that's okay. You know, we're not going for croissants here. We'll be a little bit tidier on the second roll. We're gonna give this two triple folds back to back. No waiting in between. Two triple folds back to back, all right? And one, I'm stepping out from my rolling pin. Now, bakers, you guys could, you know, it's also totally fine. You all have your own style. If you want to flower the pin, that's fine too. And you can see that my little my little mass of dough, I've got it kind of a rectangle because that's what I'm going for at this moment is kind of a rect is a, is a rough rectangle. Okay? And then you got to kind of put now remember, this is not an the 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 percentage of flour in this dough is equal to the butter and the cream cheese. So what's awesome about this is we can use the flour we need to roll it out and fold it without worrying about adding flour to a high percentage flour arugula dough there out there and um, getting a, making it tough, all right? So, I mean, that was really dramatic. But there are some arugula doughs that are, have more, um, the, the ratios are different. So this is rough, but I'm just gonna right away, I'm gonna fold toward myself and away from myself. And it's a really great idea if you have one of these and you just use it to pick up your dough and we're gonna sprinkle down more flour. So I'm gonna give the dough a quarter turn. Think of it like fabric. You know how fabric has a cross grain and it has a lengthwise grain? Well, I'm discovering that dough actually does too. I think we intuited this for years, but it's really becoming something that's um, I'm really realizing. So we're giving this a quarter turn and then we are going to you can notice I'm tapping a little bit. And all of a sudden, look at it, it's actually becoming civilized. It's actually looking like a really nice dough. I'm rolling it out to a quarter inch. So I'm hoping that you guys all have in your baker's pantry a yardstick cut in half 
because this is a standard quarter inch. This was 67 cents at the Home Depot. I've seen them as high as 75, but they rarely go above that paint department. So I'm going to just use my, um, gonna use my rulers. You guys have seen this before. I love my rulers. And I'm gonna use them as rails. And then I'm just gonna come in here and sort of shore things up. All right, now, another thing that's important when you're rolling out dough or whatever you're doing, you've got to brush away the excess flour. If we don't brush away the excess flour, then any dough that has to be layered on top of another piece of dough won't seal. And then anything on the outside of the bake, like after final baking, is going to look dry. And that's just not a good look. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm going to take the top edge, fold it over two thirds, and then the bottom edge I'm going to fold up. All right, and then I'm gonna just shore this up again. And this is gonna go into the refrigerator for an hour. You could freeze it for up to a month if it's well wrapped, no problem. Okay, so magic of TV after an hour, it's gonna look like this. So I'm actually going to, in the trying to be more sustainable, I'm going to use this piece of plastic wrap to wrap up this dough, okay? All right. So again, in about, what did I say, an hour? Hour's totally fine. You could leave it in there overnight or you could freeze it. But no more than one day because there's no sugar in this dough, which means the dough will begin to turn gray relatively quickly because there's no sugar to fight off the enzymatic browning that naturally happens in a dough, even in the refrigerator, that doesn't have any sugar in it. An enzymatic browning that's just like happens with apples and pears when they're cut. Potatoes do it too. Okay, so this is, full disclosure, this is half of the recipe because this was the other half I wanted to have. I didn't want to keep you all day. I know you guys have stuff to do and I wanted to get you back into your kitchens and baking. So it's best to roll out half at a time. Now I have a mess going here. So I'm just gonna take my scraper and I'm gonna get, scrape the bench scrape the work surface and uh, clear the clutter. I might need this. All right. So we have this nice rectangle of dough, but now, because I'm so demanding, I want a circle. So I'm gonna throw down a little flour and I'm gonna pound this into a circular shape. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this with fresh unrested dough. I'm gonna lose layers, but if the dough is well chilled, I can give it a little bit of a pound without sacrificing anything that I built in, okay? It's a thick little circle. So what I'm gonna do, as I'm going to, I don't, my hands are warm. I don't want to melt my butter. So I'm going to tap. I don't really have layers of butter in there, so I'm not going to really shatter my butter. I just want to kind of, I'm the boss. I want to get it thinner and I want to keep the circle. So I'm going to give it a quarter turn. And when I get to a half inch, I'll start to roll. All right, almost there. Yep, yeah, we can roll. 
Now, you might not get a perfect circle, and I'm actually just gonna stretch a little bit, not too much, I'm gonna stretch. You can, you can almost see, you can see the layers in the edge of the dough. Um, I'm just gonna kind of just stretch it a little bit, and now I'm gonna start to roll. Make sure there's no stickage. If there's stickage, you gotta throw a little bit more flour down. So the first thing I'm gonna do, when we're working to keep a round shape, we're gonna work on the, uh, the diagonal, all right? And you might find yourself like, you're, you're not doing that full quarter turn. You're just kind of, just maybe an eighth turn, I don't know. I never thought about eighth turns before. Oh, it's really pretty. It's really pretty. Oh, this is, um, I have a question. Oh yeah. So hold on, let me just, so this is a Home Depot yardstick that's cut in half, just like this. And then this one is got tape on it. Sand them once they're cut, because you can get splinters from them. Okay. And then this is Cori, my countertop is Corian. There was a question um, I, or about my countertop Corian. You know, there's always questions about work surfaces, what's really great for pastry. And you guys will all resonate with one surface or another. Corian, granite, marble, they, they um, are relatively cool, so they keep dough cool. So that's a help. But I also love a wood bench, you know, working on wood. The only thing that is a hot mess is, of course, tile. We always need a, we always need a board on top of tile. But I think tile countertops are, have really fallen out of fashion. Now, all right, so we're almost there. And I know you're like, oh my God, chef, that's a square. That's okay, we'll fix it. But I really don't want to waste any of my dough. I really don't. I don't wanna, I don't wanna drag out a, cook a cake pan and cut a perfect circle. Let's make it work, you guys. Okay, all right, not too bad. So we wanna be an eighth of an inch thick, all right? Right there, an eighth of an inch thick. And any time you pick up the dough, any time you move it, it, you'll notice that it springs back a little bit. So you just have to kind of course correct. All right, so there's, look at these little cuties. This, I rolled this batch of dough to an eight inch circle. And I really didn't get a ton of revolutions with this particular rugula. That's okay. There's really no rules for arugula or croissant, like how many layers. I mean, I know we see all this sexy stuff on Instagram, layers and layers and layers of croissant dough, and the same for arugula. This is totally fine. All I want you guys to know is there's a direct correlation with the number of revolutions you can get. I don't even know if that's the right thing, but the number of, of like, roles you can get, how defined it is, it starts here. So with a 10 inch circle, I will probably be able to get one more time around. All right? Okay, all right. But it doesn't matter, it's not a contest. This is not the coupe de monde, we're fine. We're just making some really beautiful, yummy rugula. If you want, if it makes you crazy, you can trim around the edge and just create your circle, all right? And you'll just have a little bit of scrap, all right? It's not a perfect circle, but I don't care. The dough is warming up. It's go time. I'm just going to check with my wonderful 
ruler here. Yeah, I'm just at about 10 inches, so that's okay. All right, so now I'll have a lot of ideas for fillings in the blog post, but, or the, you know, on the website, it's under recipe and blog post, that's where it'll be, and I'll have some good ideas. Um, you can be as creative as you like, all right? What I'm gonna do for these, I'm gonna use apricot jam, and I have a really nice, good quality apricot jam that I actually get at Trader Joe's. But Bon Maman is good, that French brand. Hero brand is really good. Smuckers is really good. There's good jam out there. And if you're a jam person, and I would guess bakers usually are super into jam, you know, you know the good brands and you know the brands you like. I'm not gonna go too crazy with the jam because I don't want the jam to necessarily burble out. And then I'm gonna do some chopped walnuts and I did these in the little food processor. They need to be fine. All right, they can't, you could use pecans, you could do no nuts. Um, you could do mini cho you you could do mini chocolate. That would be like a soccer tort. That would be really good. Mini chocolate chips or chop your chocolate fine. Okay. Raspberry jam. I mean, it's just the limit. Now, when you read some recipes for arugula and there's nuts in there, a lot of times they have you add the cinnamon sugar to the nuts. But here's the thing. What if I don't use all those nuts and then I've got this little bit of cinnamon sugar walnuts hanging out on my Baker's Pantry Metro shelving? And if you could really see my kitchen bakers, like if it was a wide, I keep things minimal. So that would put me right over the edge. So what I prefer to do, I have my jar of cinnamon sugar which is my classic ratio, 198 grams to six to eight grams of cinnamon, no more. And it's always in its pretty jar, ready to go. I'm not gonna, I'm not going to, uh-uh, no, 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 no. So if you just like everything tickety-boo like me, then you're just gonna grab your cinnamon sugar you could do regular sugar if you're not feeling the cinnamon. And then the next thing I'm gonna do, and just to be clear, this could be any nut, any jam. The jam is really helpful because it helps the nut stick. It helps whatever we're filling the rugula with stick. So that's why jam is kind of the go-to. If you don't wanna use jam, you could brush the dough with egg white, like beaten egg white, like I have here, and you could then cinnamon sugar, chocolate, whatever, but the jam is really a perfect glue. All right, so then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna try to hit my halfway point, because that's gonna be helpful. And because I'd like these to be as even as possible, Okay, so I'm gonna cut eight. I think eight, well, I could do, I did eight for the eight inch, so how about this? How about I do five, because that's a cool thing to teach you guys. I do five in each, I'm gonna do, um, I could do three, let me show you. All right, so here's this right in half. Not a problem, that's cool. But what if we wanted them a little bit smaller and we're gonna cut each of these into three? How do you do that? All right, well, the easiest way to do it is, you know, we've got, we've got three, so if we cut our odd one, we just sort of eyeball the smaller one, right? And then the larger piece right here we can just cut that in half. So I'm gonna do that here close to camera so you guys can, can see. 
So I'm gonna cut this quarter of the arugula into three because they're kind of big cut in half. We've gone to a 10 inch circle. So what I'm doing is I'm cutting off the end one here and then this one I'm cutting in half. It's kind of hard to do upside down, but that's okay. It's more important that you guys see what I'm doing. So again, the single is cut, we have the double, and then the double is also gonna get cut in half. All right? Any questions about that, let me know, but I think, that I, I think that's, uh, I hope that's helpful. The other thing we can do, like croissants, is give these just a little stretch, and then we start to roll, not too tight, not too loose, just right. You wanna give the point a little bit of a pinch, all right? And I have my, sorry to be off, uh, out of frame, but I have my lined, uh, I've got my pan right here, all right? So then I'm just gonna, they don't really grow. They need at least like a half inch in between them, maybe three quarters. So let's just show you. And when you're not trying to do this, like I'm trying to do this, then um, you'll, you'll be able to be super precise. What do I mean? <laughs> like if you're not talking at the same time. And you can always roll backwards as well so that you're not picking them up, you're not wasting time, it's more efficient. So yeah, I'd love, my vanity knows no bounds. I'd love to get kind of a tighter one. So I just stretch this one a little bit, not tighter, but just with more. Yeah, that's a cutie. I like that. You'll notice, kind of like croissant dough, as it begins to warm up, you can give it a gentle stretch. But don't force it, it doesn't matter. Like I said, this is not, this is, we're just having fun. We don't have to be all crazy, okay? So this is your arugula. And then once you get them, once they're on the pan and they're all shaped, brush them with a little beaten egg white or water or milk, it doesn't matter, and then sprinkle them with some sugar, cinnamon sugar, or if you have that really pretty sanding sugar, um, it has another name too, but that just went out of my head. Sanding sugar, crystal sugar, that's fun too. One last note before we go, bakers. I've been teasing about the savory arugula, but I wanna be serious for a second. You absolutely could. You even like a, a really nice store-bought pesto and some Parmesan cheese, and then a little bit of egg white wash and uh, some parm on top that would be really great, really delicious. The reason we're using, and it's the last thing, I promise and then I'll let you go, the reason we're using egg white wash or water or milk and not whole egg beaten up is because we don't wanna encourage over browning. You'll notice when you read the recipe on Monday that the bake temperature is at 375, very much like croissants. We need to bake these. We we want our layers to lift. Uh, we want our layers to lift. We need to bake these at slightly higher temperatures so they they lift and they take on a beautiful light golden brown crust color relatively quickly. So that's why the 375. Now you guys know your ovens. If your oven runs hot, just adjust accordingly. And you might want to have another baking tray on deck. To double pan halfway through if you notice that the bottoms of your cookies or anything you bake biscuits scones whatever croissants whatever you're doing tends to over brown that's the way to deal with that everyone this was kind of a long show and I thank you so much for staying with me 
And if you're watching on the replay, thank you as well for watching all, for sticking with us this long. Any questions about the rugula, let me know. And I'll be back again live in two weeks with another episode of The Dough Doctor. Stay safe, enjoy your baking, and I will see you all soon. Bye.